We're reading from Colossians chapter 3, starting from verse 22. This is what the Lord says. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. You know, they say it's not what you do, but how you do it that matters. And, and there's so much truth in that because, you know, it doesn't matter what job you have. I know the world kind of has certain jobs up the top and certain jobs down the bottom. Bible won't think like that. You know, the garbage collector, the, the person who works in the sewage plant is as vital to our social and physical health as, say, a specialist and a medical specialist or, or dentist, or whatever. Everyone's got a part to play in the kind of work they're involved in, whether it's paid or unpaid, whether it's volunteer, whether it's post-retirement or pre-retirement, whether it's domestic chores at home, whether it's mothering, whether it's unemployed looking for a job. There's a sense where what we're doing now is thinking through what does it look like to have Jesus Lord during those hours that make up my day and your day. And let's be fair, there are non-Christians who are simply just much better at the job that we're in than we are. I remember asking people um, a couple of years ago at MBM about their best boss and one person said, you know, my non-Christian gay manager uh, at 3 p.m. would come down into the call centre and take the calls with the team for an hour. He didn't have to do that. He got the promotion. But he kept coming back because he wanted to be with his team. And uh, But what a non-Christian worker can't do is make Jesus look good. Only you who follow Jesus can do that. At work, our relationships are key. Relationships with those we report to, relationships who we're with, alongside and those who report to us or who we serve as customers and clients. And so the next five points is really trying to look at from different aspects, how is it that we can actually have Jesus as our Lord? Point one, servant-hearted like Christ. When we say Jesus is my Lord, you know what we're saying, don't you? We're saying I am his willing slave. Kind of puts another side to that. I am his willing slave and I will do what it takes to glorify him. In Mark chapter 10, James and John, two of the 12, desperate to get front row seats in the kingdom of God, try to pull Jesus aside because they think it's first in, first serve and survival of the fittest. And Jesus says, boys, in the kingdom of God, we're not going to play this game. Mark 10 verse 42. Mark 10 verse 42. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, the nations, lorded lorded it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is saying, I want you to be like me. And in this sense, that I did not come for my sake, but for yours. I came to that cross, being a a blood-bought ransom ticket for you to be purchased into heaven. We are to follow Jesus, who has this other person mindset. I am here for you. And that's the mindset you take into the building site. That's the mindset you take to the factory floor. That's the mindset you take into the office, the boardroom, the lunchroom, the staff room. Whether the person is with your boss, your manager, whether it's with your co-workers, your clients, your apprentices, those who report to you, I'm here for you. That's the paradigm shift that God is calling us to have. Like Jesus, other person-centred. I love hearing, and I'm saying I hear it a lot, but I love hearing when someone comes to church and saying, you know, the reason why I'm here is because that person over there, I watched them at my workplace and I was impressed with what I saw. But you can't make Jesus look good at work if your attitude to work stinks. So point two, diligence. 
Work hard. Did you know that one out of every 20 proverbs, one out of every 20 proverbs is speaking against laziness? It's kind of like a big deal in the Bible. Let's look at Proverbs 18.9. One who is slack in his work is brother to one who destroys. You don't think of lazy as being a destroying element, but it is. Laziness is a form of theft, really. It steals from your boss. It abandons your co-workers. It abandons the project that you've got people working on. It neglects your clients. It rips off your students. If you're down to do a job, do it with all your heart. If you've got chores at home or a study program, give it your best. If you're unemployed, work hard at getting a job. If you're working on the dole, work like you're getting fully paid. If you're on sick leave, then rest well and put all your energy into getting better. Sluggards, filled with excuses. Look at 22.13. How's this for two reasons why people don't work? The sluggard says, there's a line outside. I'm going to stay home and watch Netflix. Or... I'll be murdered in the streets. <laughs> uh, you know, you know the argument. Uh, the interview's too early. I'm overqualified. I'm underqualified. I haven't got transport. Work seems too boring. Uh, excuses. The general rhythm in the Bible runs like this: work hard, rest well. Work hard, rest well. If you're a workaholic, then rest well. If you're a restaholic, work. <laughs> I just made a word. I know. Point three, wisdom. You may not be the best at your job. You know, that's not the end of the world. You're not letting Jesus down. Just be the best you can be. That's all he asks you to do. One man said about his boss, he was a Hindu boss, and he was a lovely man who taught him to learn from every new experience. There was wisdom. He worked on the CANI principle, C-A-N-I. It was an acronym. It stood for Constant and Never-Ending Improvement. Uh, and we just won't get better at whatever we're doing unless we learn, study, reflect, take counsel, receive feedback. Seems to me pride is the great enemy of anything getting better. Um, constantly that desire, I want to be the best I can be, that's exactly what you would always aspire for, but you can't be that unless you're prepared to be humble enough to receive feedback. Proverbs 27 verse 17 assumes that as shh, shh, Iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. But absolutely no sharpening happens if there's pride getting in the way of receiving feedback. And that's why, in a sense, I've got to apologise to you because here at MBM for 28 years, I've only had a mentor for the last 10. That means the first 18 years I was running according to my own intuition and not much more. And, and as a result, I think the church suffered. Um, but now I've made it my aim to get someone who knows more than me in the role that I'm in so they can speak into my life, and it has actually made me a better pastor. Uh, so that's right, you're thinking, you mean you could have been worse, right? Yes, I could have been much worse, that's right. I suggest you get one as well. All the senior pastors at church are required to have a mentor, someone who knows more about their area than they do, who can speak into their world so they can be the best pastors for you. Well, that's wisdom about how we do the particular job. But as you know, the hardest thing about work is other people um, and the difficulties. You know, people say, I say to them, how are you going? Oh, I'm really stressed at work. I always say, not what is it, who is it? Because there's always a person behind that. You think about all the stresses you have at work, I reckon 99% of them has got to be people. It's rarely this thing I can't fix. Sometimes it is that. But usually it's even that, you know, someone puts a deadline. Well, it's usually the person who put the deadlines to stress anyway. To ask a missionary, what's the hardest thing about being a missionary? They'll always tell you, other missionaries. They drive them nuts. So be wise in the way you deal with people. And so here are 12 thoughts, and you can apply this at all parts of your life. Um, 12 thoughts when conflict arises, and they will. Number one, try to understand the issue fully before speaking. Try to understand the issue fully before speaking. Two, train yourself to think the best when you disagree with someone. Um, avoid judging motives. Stay out of people's hearts. Ask yourself, what is the other person trying to guard, protect? Because chances are you probably want to guard and protect that value anyway. Three, don't react to every issue. It's good to let things pass you by. Proverbs 19.11, how's this one? This is a real gem. Really, they're all gems. I've been saying that with every proverb. A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offence. Mm -mm. 
Mm-mm. The person who acts like a relational police person is not going to function well in life. Let things go. Yeah, let those minor hurts pass you by. Um, five, if you've been repeatedly hurt, go to the person directly. That's what Matthew 18 says. Now, you'd only break this rule if there's bullying, sexual harassment, or children involved. Go directly to the person. Six, do not use emails, text messages, Facebook, Twitter to communicate your criticism and concerns and problems. That, how many times have people done that? It's not the purpose of, well, it's not a godly way of using social media, let me put it that way. A problem that's that big ends up being that big, and once it comes out, it's very hard to pull back in. Seven, if your first goal when you actually approach someone in a context where there's been a problem, your goal is not that they listen and agree with you. That shouldn't be your goal because you've got no control. Your goal should be to speak in a way that clearly explains the problem in a respectful tone because that you've got control over. What they do with it is outside. You know, Paul says, be at peace with all people as much as it depends on you. Eight, if the other person escalates the problem by shouting, screaming, swearing, berating, end the conversation. You're going nowhere with that one. Uh, I had one person on the phone. They weren't an MBM person and it wasn't a pastoral matter. I had a person on the other end of the phone and the person was like, F and this and, you know, shouting at that. And, and I said, look, I want to hear everything you want to say, but you've got to cut the swearing and the cursing and the shouting because I, I can't hear you. It's getting in the way. Uh, otherwise, I'll hang up. Anyway, they kept swearing, they kept cursing, they kept shouting. So I hung up. <laughs> then they ring did you hang up on me? Yeah, I said that. I said, if you keep doing it, I'm going to hang up on you. <laughs> and, and then they kept swearing, cursing, and shouting. So I hung up again. Did you hang up again on me? I said, yes. It was one of those rare times where I kept my tone really nice. <laughs> I don't have many of these illustrations, so I needed to tell you this one. And, and then third time, I did it again. Did you? <laughs> yes, that's right. But it was amazing. Eventually, he learned, and I finally got to hear his legitimate concerns. He just expressed it in an illegitimate way. Nine, when the, uh, no, I've said nine. Don't, um, oh, yes, nine. When the problem escalates and you think, hmm, this is getting out of control, you need a third party to come in. And again, that's generally a rule anyway in all of life. You, you think, I can't solve this with this other person. They can't solve it with me. I need, the, I need the right person who we both agree to come in and help mediate and help each other hear each other. I don't know how many, it's a little bit humbling, but gee, it gets you, it, you move much forward with the problem. Ten, don't be shocked that problems reoccur. My goodness, you're a fallible human being and so are they. And so am I. Eleven, Explore, especially in the workplace, systems of appeals uh, that are available. Big companies have them. Small family businesses probably don't, so you might need the counsel of others. <coughs> Twelve, remember, you're free to leave. You're just not free to stay and badmouth other people. Right, point four, integrity. Not only work hard, but work honestly. Listen to Deuteronomy 25 up on the screen, Deuteronomy 25. You must have accurate and honest weights and measures so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. For the Lord your God detests anyone who does these things, anyone who deals dishonestly. It's picking up on those days when you had physical scales, like say the butcher would put a kilo of meat and then put his thumb on the scales and it'd become one and a half kilos. So you're paying more than what you're getting for. And, and Jesus saying, don't do that. Deal honestly with your customers. Don't rip them off. Deal justly with your workers. Uh, help them out. Pay them what's right. Deal properly with your co-workers. Help them out when they need it. Deal honestly with your boss. Don't claim hours that you're not doing. And deal truthfully with your government. Pay your taxes. Well, that's easy to say, but I know in every congregation there are people who have lost their jobs because they've done the right thing as Christians. Some have gone into bankruptcy because they've done the right thing when others have cheated the government. Um, others who've missed out on promotions because they wouldn't lie or cheat or others took the credit for their work. Gee, it hurts. It's a real grief. It, you know, part of it's the price of actually wanting to have Jesus as your Lord. And I want to simply say this. Jesus will say, it's an honour, great will be your reward. He's not saying don't make proper appeals if they're, they're available to you, but great will be your reward. Once you have the big picture in mind, you can live with the minor injustices. And integrity also has got to do with the attitude in which you work, not just 
for to you know carry favor with the boss but actually because you're serving the Lord Jesus and so we go to the passage at hand in Colossians 3 it's actually about slaves masters which reflected a certain era in the time of the world I think about a third of the people of the Roman Empire were slaves but it was an economic relationship and so it's not a straight transfer but we're dealing the closest we've got of course is employer employee and so this is what Paul says slaves obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favour, a nice one for the Indians there, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that uh, you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favouritism. We know as Australians we have an anti-authoritarian bug within us. But in Christ, we actually show respect to those in authority, whether it's popular or not, even when they're doing the wrong thing. I mean, we may not agree with them, but we don't. our attitude of obedience does not de is not determined on whether we think they're a good boss or not. And the point, he put, the point that he's particularly emphasising in your working relationship is you work hard not because the boss is working and you're going to score a promotion or a bonus. That's not the reason why you do it. Jesus is saying, I want you to work hard for my sake, not just your boss's. In fact, you working hard for your boss is how you work hard for me. Look at the phrases there. To do it with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. To do it, he says, whatever you do, do it, uh, sorry, work at it with all your heart. See how it's a hard issue? Your heart's engaged in all those hours you're in the workplace. Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. So isn't that interesting? There's you, there's your boss, and there's the Lord Jesus. It's a three-sided relationship. It's never just you and your boss and whatever power struggle you're in with them. Jesus says, "I, your boss may not see you work hard, but I will see it and I will remember it and I will reward you and I will give you that eternal bonus that your boss may never do, will never do. And even if he's not watching, Jesus says, I'm watching. Now, what this means is you stand back and, oh, my goodness, that means all those hours I spend doing all that stuff, <laughs> you know, whether it's a nursing mother or a volunteer uh, or um, uh, someone in, in, in a paid work situation, all those hours spent, you know, whether it's domestic work or commercial work, all of it now is holy. All of it becomes the sphere on which to get to glorify God as I give it my best for Jesus' sake. That's extraordinary. You, you get to glorify God to the same extent as our missionaries who are overseas. I always tell people about who think they're going to come into full-time paid ministry, I said, whatever you do, don't ever think you're glorifying God more than the rest of the congregation. Because a godly Christian, whether they're in full-time ministry or not, if they're godly, they're glorifying God. But I love that. So you, as you wake up in the morning and someone says to you, where are you going? What do you do? I said, I'm going out to glorify my Lord Jesus. How are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to be the best worker I can be. I'm going to love the people who I work with. And a lot of it's got to do with relationships at work. Um, and that's why our words are so precious. Look at Ephesians 4.29. It says it positively, then it says it negatively. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. That's negative, right? But only what is helpful for the building up of others to their needs that it may benefit those, those who listen. So don't let any words that tear down come out of your mouth. Only speak words that build up. So I wonder, usually I'm going to issue another list here. Ponder which, which one of these is the one God wants you to work on. Words that refuse to gossip and slander. Words that build up and encourage. Words that are spoken with gentleness and grace. Words that carry truth in love. Words that are marked by unqualified apologies. I'm sorry, I was wrong, I have no excuse. Words that will not lie no matter how much pressure is brought to bear. Brought to, brought to bear. Words that will not revert to smutty humour. 
words that will speak of Jesus and his grace. That's why it always pays to tell your boss in the interview that you're a Christian and you're not going to lie, cheat. You know, um, just a word on swearing. Um, some workplaces can feel like there's no option but to swear to get the job done. Like you've got a foreman and he's got 50 people and there's a big building project and he wants them to get going. You know, usually 50 expletives are the way he gets it done. Especially on the building side, perhaps a policeman, you're in the army, correctional services particularly are vulnerable to this. The trade, sporting fields, staff rooms. It's a lie to say that you can't do your job without swearing. It's a lie to say that you can only do your job, you can't do your job without swearing. And you know why? Because there are other people who've done your job. You know, people who are in the correctional services, and I reckon they, they're under the most pressure, um, you know, guards in prisons. They, it's really hard for them. And I always send them to the Baptist minister at Doonside, who used to be at correctional services, because he learned how to gain authority without the F word. And if you can't do your job without swearing, then don't violate your conscience. I remember there, there was an NRL player. We interviewed a church, a Christian man. He used to play winger for Penrith and um, years ago now. And he, his coach at the time said this, and I quote, my aim is to make you swear like a man. What kind of a name is that? Well, that coach lost his job and hasn't been coaching since, actually. He lost it 12 months after he said that to him. But you know that, that, that Christian footballer, he stayed and kept his integrity right to the very end when he resigned. And he left that workplace, and it's a very physical and very hard workplace, let me tell you. But he kept his manhood and his Christ-like godliness by being above reproach. Point five, love. God wants to see love at work, or literally, <laughs> um, because it's all about relationships. Without love, what does 1 Corinthians say? We are. Without love, we are nothing. We're a nobody. It's not like we're halfway there. We're nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, sure, it's firstly about the church uh, in our church relationships, but it's just as true in our families, in our marriages, and in our workplace. And there are, in 1 Corinthians 13, there are 16 things that are, you can be relaxed, I'm not going to go through all 16. There are 16, oh no, it's going to be a long story. There are 16 things that you do, that love does and does not do. I'll look at three. Verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Now, we normally think this in terms of a wedding sermon, right? Mm -mm, it's about all of life. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. Kindness. Simple word, isn't it? It's exactly how God treats us every day, even though we rebel against him. Kindness that wants to help someone new at work when they're struggling. Kindness that wants to go and put some extra effort into someone who's really battling with their load at work. Kindness that that goes an extra mile for the customer or the client. And people are just starved of, of, of kindness and encouragement at work. Little kindnesses, you know, it happens in the family. It doesn't happen in the family. Like we stop saying to the person who cooks the meal, thank you. Whether it was a great meal or an average meal, thank you. Thank you for going through all the effort, the little things. Um, I've told the story once before. I went into my local McDonald's here at Mount Druid. It's the one opposite the Turkish uh, mosque. And... Um, uh, as I was walking in, my two Mac Cafe ladies, Mel and Allie, um, had my flat white half strength skim milk with an equal, would have been decaf except it was before three, um, what you call a why bother coffee. They had it ready for me literally as I was coming in the door, piping hot, ready to go. I was shocked. They must have seen me park the car. I said, ladies, this is extraordinary service. And I was just so overwhelmed. I just didn't see it coming. I got on the phone and I called, you know, the office at McDonald's in the city and said, you've got two great McCafe ladies here, you know, and I just raved about them for a couple of minutes. Anyway, they got a phone, their manager got a phone call. 
obviously brimming with pride. The manager got to uh, get, talk to them and really honoured them, and and they were so chuffed. I mean, I did get particularly good service after that as well, but that was by the by. <laughs> I didn't know for that reason. But I think what it was, it was such a little thing, but I saw the impact and I thought, my goodness, isn't that a reminder of how little encouragement people have at work, that such a little thing could have such a big effect? Can you imagine how good Jesus would look if we operated with a heart that wants to love and demonstrate kindness in word and deed? Let's listen to Josh Lee. I, I met up with him last Friday and I, on my iPhone I filmed what he was sharing the, the month before about the things he'd learned concerning his attitude to the people at, at work where he works in Parramatta. Recently, I was encouraged by changing my mindset. I'm Korean and work in finance, so um, life has always been about hard work and outcome driven. And I found that I had no time for people and I, I didn't value relationships at work, but um, I was encouraged to genuinely care for people. And little things such as saying good morning or how you doing, I had no substance behind it, but now I found that I do care for them. I do want to know how they're doing. Um, and that's evolved into more where I'm having some conversations about Jesus and sharing what he's done, not just for me, but for them. And as a result, I found real joy in being able to do that. Yep, he found joy. And Oh, he said all of a sudden I've got much more Jesus conversations happening. Why? Because I'm starting to actually meaningfully love people around me. So encouraging. Love is kind. And then negatively, love does not envy. This is the second of the three. Um, someone at 6 p.m. said, I didn't think I was proud and envious until someone got the job I applied for. That'll usually do it. <clears throat> And love means that you express your happiness for their success. I'm really glad you got the job. Love wants to encourage. Envy wants to withhold encouragement. And like Jesus, uh, love keeps no record of wrongs. Even when you didn't get the job because of favoritism, uh, even when you made a little mistake and the boss just blew up way out of proportion. Or even when your customers are rude and demanding, and I know, I've been a customer, you poor things. Um, like the things people on the, on the phones and the, on service delivery have to experience. My goodness, everyone had evidence for the original sin. Just talk to them. <laughs> but it is really a constant posture of, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I don't want to hold this against them. I don't want to punish the next client because the previous one was really rude to me. Well, let's wrap it up. Um, if a person from your work or study came into this service and saw you praising the Lord, fellowshipping, serving, would they say, A, really, I had no idea. There wasn't even a clue that this person was a Christian. I saw no evidence in the way they conducted themselves at work. Or would they say, you know, I knew there was something different about that person. I just couldn't put my finger on and and it's no surprise to me that they're a follower of Jesus because they look awfully like him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to live for your son who died for us. We want to glorify you in our place of work and study. We want to make you look good before a watching world. And yes, we want to ask for forgiveness, for we have at times behaved badly in those places. So transform us by your spirit to work hard, to work wisely, and to truly love and respect those whom we report to, those whom we work with, those who report to us, our clients, our customers, Oh, Lord, may, may they see the light of Jesus in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.